So today's video will be talking about how ePrints hangs together, which directories things are in, um, what you should change to, to, to kind of to, to configure ePrints, when you should change things, when you should make new files, where those files should be, if you have an issue with ePrints, where you kind of have a look to find out where the files might be. Um, and so let's let's get started. So this is a this is the standard Ubuntu training VM I've been working on for all of these training videos. Um, and in Ubuntu and Debian derivatives, um, where is the uh, where is ePrint installed? So the easiest way to find out is to have a look at the Apache configuration. Um, so I've got a, a root shell here on the on the server, which happens to be this local VM. Um, So we'll look at the ePrints configuration. It says include this file. Uh, user share ePrints3 config apache.conf. Um, and if we have a look inside that file, um, we can see that it's including a number of other files. But importantly, um, this user share ePrints3 is where Apache is looking for ePrints. So let's switch to the ePrints user. This is the ePrints user. Um, in Debian, through a package install, you get the cprints user. That's this kind of system user. That the home, the home of it is user share ePrints three. Um, and if we look in here, we'll see this is the directory we're referring to over in this one. User share ePrints three config apache star .conf. It will load everything in here. And if we have a look at what's in here. You can see this is the configuration for this repository. Um, so, what do we have? What is ePrints? ePrints is kind of a set of Perl scripts and uh, an HTML that's served out connecting to the database. Um, if you want to know where the database is for any particular install, that is usually installed. Um, uh, that's in the config.d directory of each repository. Now, you have to be a bit careful. The default file is uh, database.pl, but this stuff can be stored in, in any file in here. So if you, if you kind of, the best way to do is to do something like a grep And see which files that appears in, um, because these. One of the things about the config.d directory is it's all just loaded, and it's all just one kind of Perl structure uh, under $c for configuration. So if you set anything in a later file, it can just kind of override this. So if I if I um, uh, if I um, set db name to something else. In a file that's um, like that, z underscore db dot pl, um, I can I can override these settings. But once you've had a see, once you've seen this file, you know how to get into the database. Minus u, red house, minus p. And we can see um, these are these are the ePrints tables. Um, there is uh, an ePrint table which is one column for each non-multiple field in uh, your ePrint dataset, and then. We also have one table for each um, multiple field. Um, and if you've got multiple compound fields, like the contributors that has an ID, a name, and a contribution type, then you have one table for each, uh, for each part of that. But let's take <coughs> um, uh, describe print underscore 
contributors name. So we have in here, we have the ePrint that it's associated with. The POS, POS is, um, it's the, the, whether it's the first, the second, the third, the fourth value in this field. And then we have the various parts of uh, a, a, a name field. Um, if we have a look at ePrint, oh, let me say, show tables like ePrint projects. This is a, a, a simpler field. This is just a, a, a text field. Um, and we can see we've got an ePrint ID, a pause, and the, uh, the, the, the so, so notice that we have this ePrint underscore projects. Projects is the field name, and then we have projects as the column name. So if you need to query the database to have a look at what uh, the values on a particular item are, this is how you build up these queries. Um, understanding the structure will help you with that. So that's the database. Um, let's take a look in more detail at a repository's config.d directory. So this contains Perl, uh, Perl configuration. And that's some of this is very simple. Like if we, if we have a look at this, this is just setting uh, a configuration variable to a value, but some configurations uh, are functions. So if we look at ePrint fields uh, default, for example, this is, uh, again, we've got this $C configuration, we're setting the configuration value, but we're setting it to a function. Um, so there's a lot of kind of uh, code and funny shenanigans that can go on in this uh, configuration directory, um, and it's aware most of your effort, I guess, uh, when you're when you're developing uh, an ePrints repository with advanced features, most of your effort will be spent in here. Um, a couple of important files: ePrints, ePrint render .pl, ePrint render. ePrint render is where. Um, the, the rendering for abstract pages comes from. So if you want to change that, um, that's the file you do it in. Um, browse views, again, controlling the browse views. Um, there is a training video on that. You should try to, oh, one thing you should try to do when you're managing this directory um, is to try and avoid changing files. So if you have, um, let's, let's take ePrintFields.pl. So ePrintFields.pl just creates a, a, an array of field definitions. And this array is, um, is, is uh, this .c fields ePrint. But if you have to add a new field, you don't necessarily need to add it to this file. You could, um, You can create a new file. And then you can just push onto that. Um, there, there, are, there is actually a better way to do ePrint fields, but in, in the general case, what you're looking to do to make upgrading easier is not modify any of the local fields. So when it comes time to upgrade, you can just diff them against the default configuration of the new repository. And um, let me show you what that looks like. So if I do a... In the lib directory, there's a folder from which um, ePrint repositories are created. Um, so we can diff against that. Um, and when we're doing an upgrade, we can see, well, admin email, core and database, these are all generated, they're not stored. Uh, but we can see that we've got this modification to the default repository. Now, <coughs> in, the, 
In that case, we know that, well, none of these files have been modified. We can just throw them away and bring in the new, the new defaults. Um, and if you do that every time you upgrade, then you have a, a well-maintained repository. But let's take a look. I think we've digressed slightly off of... Uh, part of the problem is there's no natural way to show all of this. There's no, there's no narrative that will just take us through this really easily. But let's take a look at the bin directory briefly now. The, um, the bin directory is where the command line utilities for regenerating views, generating abstracts, things like that are. And the key script here that's most commonly used is epadmin. Um, and so, you know, epadmin create will create a new repository. epadmin create user will create a new user. Um, epadmin recommit will rewrite all of your items to the database. If you have some code that gets run every time they're, they're written, that will run that. Um, re-index, if you're having issues with search and the indexer, you can just re-index everything. Update will, if you add a new field, uh, EPAB and update will add it to the database. Upgrade, if you've done an upgrade on the files, upgrade will also upgrade the database. Um, so when you run EPAbmin, uh, EPAbmin create, what will happen, it will ask you a few questions and then it will copy the contents of the default config directory into the config directory of your archive. And that's what your, your, um, your archive configuration is based on. Um, so in every version you've got installed, it will have a slightly different default configuration. Um, you shouldn't ever modify this, um, but it's there and, and that's what it is. It's useful to know sometimes. Um, the lib directory contains also um, <sighs> configuration files that are applied to all repositories. So if you have a look in, for example, in workflows, you have, you have uh, the user workflow is located in here. Um, and we have a user workflow here too, but we don't have these other ones like uh, event queue, EPM, request, save search, the subject workflow, which is used by the, the subject editor. Um, now, if you want to modify these on a repository by repository basis, uh, the, the same is true for, uh, for for templates. Let's demonstrate that because there's an order of precedence. There are several places something like a template could be. It could be in a local configuration or it could be in a central configuration. Um, and it will look locally first. And if it's there, it will use it. Otherwise, it will fall back to the central one. So. Um, the default repository configuration doesn't contain a template. You're expected to create your own, and so it will use the, 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 the template while you do this. So let's just oops. Let's copy the template directory into Uh, so now we have a template directory. We didn't before. So let's edit this template. Um, oops. And we can put in here central. Now if we refresh this, maybe. So we've got this central at the top. Now, ePrints tries to be a bit clever about where its um, templates are from. It knows it's been using this central one, and the central one has changed, so it will it will it will pull that configuration through. Oops. I've put it in the archive directory rather than the configuration directory. So we've created this local template. If we refresh, it still says central. And the reason for that is it doesn't know which configuration file. It, it, it's not aware of this local configuration yet. So 
A lot of configuration files, if you change them, ePrints will detect that change and pull up the configuration into Apache, but it doesn't know. So, um, so we have to go reload. Restarting the um, restarting Apache will also reload the configuration. So now we have the local template loaded. And this goes for phrases as well. Um, we have this lang directory in which we have uh, language specific content for the repository. And the system.xml file is where most of the phrases for your repository are. It's very long. It's, it's 4,000 lines long, and it has a huge number of phrases in. Um, and if you need to change any of these, don't change it in this file. All you need to do is change it locally. So, for example, um, let's take... Um, let's log in first. This phrase here, new item, right? So this phrase here, if we wanted to change this, what we would want to do we go to the repositories phrase uh, uh, phrase directory and we edit the local.xml where, where local changes to phrases are stored and then we'll paste it in there we'll change it to new publication and once again, it's unlikely that that will change without reloading the configuration because, oh no, it will change. So it detected the file has changed, it loaded that up, and we now have new publication instead of new item. <coughs> Speaking of the archive directory, inside the archives directory, we have a directory for each repository with the repository ID as the directory name. Inside there we have the var directory, which is for temporary files. If you if you have some kind of process that's generating some state or some, some temporary files, that's a good place to put it. We have the documents directory where documents are stored, and it's important to understand how that's structured. Um, there's nothing in there at the moment, but let's upload something. Um, let's uh, uh, oh, let's do a, a search for a picture of a man. Here we go. We have a picture of a man. Um, uh, desktop. Stick it on the desktop so we can find it. Now. What we'll do now is we'll create a new publication. Oof, what is wrong? I've seen this before. I think it might be a permissions issue. This isn't good. Um, Oops. 
home directory. Uh, for now, Uh, let's see if that's fixed it. Sorry. I've seen this before. What is the problem? Let's have a look at a real system. There's something not quite right with this, um, but I don't want to fix it now. I want to talk about what I want to talk about now. Let's have a look at... Um, So this is Southampton's uh, <sighs> This is Southampton's um, documents directory. Now each directory here is a, a, a mount point for um, some space. And eprints will when you upload a document, it will store the files of that document in some available space. So let's take, let's find a, an item with a document attached to it um, in the Southampton repository. So here we go, uh, we have a, a restricted document here, so I can't download it without uh, being in a, a login, but I can see that this item is 376169. So I know it's recent, so it's probably in this one, 38. So what number was it? 38, I don't know, it was 37. Oh, so it's not. So what I'm looking for is this, 370037, because the, the item starts with a 37. So I should be able to go at 379169. Three, no, it's not in that directory either. Seven nine one six nine. So this is where this document is stored. This eprint zero zero uh, eprint eprint 
ID 379169, its documents are stored here. In this mount point on documents, which somebody has called disk0.back, I think somebody was being unwise perhaps. Um, and then it's broken down in two digit uh, by two digit blocks of the ID of the item. And then inside that, if I do a, a find, we have um, this is kind of the the this this index number here is only ever used in this context for this path. It's a meaningless ID number. Each document also has a separate ID, and I don't believe this is the pos in the database table. I think this is just the order that these were created that it gives it this index number, and then it stores its path in the database. Um, so we have um, we have the document itself, the PDF that's been uploaded, and then the other documents we have are um, images of um, of, of, of this for, for the purposes of preview. Now this is a, a, a um, restricted document, so the previews don't show. But if it ever became public, it, it wouldn't. And these are documents that attach to the ePrint, but they're kind of internal system documents. And then what we have is we also have a number of XML files. Every time an item is modified, a kind of an XML dump of the state of the item is stuck in the revisions directory. Um, and this is what the, what the history information is generated from. If we look at, an, an, oh, can't look at items in this, but if you look at an item and you click on the, the history section, you get this kind of diff of, uh, of the changes. And, and what it's doing is it's diffing this XML file with the previous one or the next one. Right, I can't remember where we were. Um, right, let's have a brief chat about static static files. So, um, in the configuration directory, oh sorry, that's the documents directory, CGI, you can have local CGI files um, that will run just for this repository, and if you install a bizarre package, that's where it will put any CGI uh, 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 scripts that are uh, associated with this. That directory may or may not exist when when uh, when your repository is created. Um, the HTML directory has inside it a directory for each language, and then in there we have um, e the prints ready to uh, ready to serve. And if you look in the ePrints directory, oh no, not that. The the which directory was it? If you look in the view directory, you you'll see all of the all of the directories and, and indices for the browse views. Um, so that may be worth exploring just to get a feel for it. Um, if we create something in there, uh, forget that, don't create anything in there. Um, it will show up at the front end if you create an HTML in there, you'll just be able to load it, but that's just a file on a web server. But when you run generate static, it will complain. If you want to just stick something up, it really belongs in the configuration directory. And we have two static directories. We have the, the non-language specific static directory where stuff can go, and we have we have the lang static directory, lang en static, and this is this is for um, for for the language specific stuff. So we also have this um, this. Uh, automatic star directory, anything in here gets bundled up in, again, alphabetical order into the site CSS file. And also we've got this JavaScript uh, um, file, that, uh, a directory that you can put stuff into. <coughs> so just a quick demo of the static pages. Um, and then I think we've covered most things. Plugins need to be covered too, actually. I've got a list over here of the things I'm covering. Um, so,
We've got these X pages, but you don't have to use X page. You can just drop in .html. Um, so if I try and go to We get this hello, and if we go to bar.html and we refresh, oh, no, we've got to go to bar.html, we can't refresh. So these, these files automatically kind of push through. Now if we look at, then we have here, we have bar.html and we have foo.html that have kind of come through to the front end from the static directory. Um, if it doesn't, we can run generate static. And if we move bar and now we run generate static, um, we get this, we'll get a warning and it will say we've got this unrecognized file. And so if we run it with the minus minus prune, it removes it for us because we don't want anything in the HTML directory that's not supposed to be there. Right, so uh, that's static. Um, citations, again we've got these citations and we also have we also have even more citations in the global lib directory and again if you need to modify any of these create the appropriate directory create the citation, tweak it, don't tweak anything in the in the global directory. Um, finally, plugins. Where could plugins be? Let's see if we can install a bizarre package. I couldn't create an item. I hope I can create a bizarre, uh, install a bizarre package. Let's install, um, uh, not repository, that's enormous and horrible and complicated. Ah, the Wordle generator. That one's that one's nice and cute. Um, so that's installed, but where's it gone? Um, so in LibyPM we have Wordle link, which, which I happen to know is the idea of the repository uh, of the um, bizarre package. But we also have this um, plugin directory in lib. And the bizarre package has installed a plugin there. So there are actually three places plugins can be. They can be in the Perl lib directory. Um, or they can be in the lib plugins directory. And under there we have this kind of ePrints plugin export. But also you can create a plugins directory for each repository. And you need to, because of the way it works, you need to start at you need to create a structure, a directory structure like this in it, and then you can have repository specific plugins in in the uh, in the repository configuration directory. Um, I think that's um, a kind of a, a fairly kind of scattergun, disorganized, just quick tour of the back end. Um, 
I think I'm done.